So what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you to start off with a lot of pen and ink examples by different artists, uh, you know, throughout probably a range of about 50 years or so, because there was a time period when uh, drawing and pen and ink was, was really the go-to thing for illustrators. It was easy to put it in the newspaper or uh, we really hadn't got to color of photography um, at that point. And there was sort of a heyday of really fabulous uh, pen and ink artwork. And I'm keen to show this to you because there is a looseness um, and a, a facility to a lot of this work that I find is lost in a lot of pen and ink today. If you, if you Google pen and ink drawings, there's a lot of really stiff work out there. And what I'm hoping is to show you today what the various options are, and they are myriad. Um, I, I sat down to try to do a couple of examples of pen and ink to show you. And quite frankly, I, there are so many different stylistic choices. I decided just to show you some of these really great artists. And then we'll do some uh, warm up with hatching and trying different strokes and this, that, and the other. And then we're going to, because this is about uh, places and people that we'll be doing in pen and ink. We're gonna concentrate on the places part uh, today. And for the second half of the class, we'll be drawing in a location, but it's a live video I took. So things are moving, things are happening. So, you know, I'd like to give you a little challenge along with everything else. The scene itself is not terribly um, complex. You can make it as complex as you want to, but I'm hoping that by looking at all this other artwork before we get started, you'll, it'll give you some ideas of, of what direction to go in. So I'm gonna start uh, sharing my screen. So welcome back to Summer of uh, Drawing. And this is class number seven, pen and ink, places and people. So let me just go over just a little bit some of the pen and ink tools, uh, which you may be familiar with already. Um, usually the type of ink is either an India ink or a waterproof ink, um, something very dark, but you can also use a beautiful brown or blue or green. I mean, you can use any kind of ink you want. Pen and ink is really a very, very flexible medium. Some people use brushes uh, to apply it or they mix it with uh, line work from, from pen types. One thing that's really common now are these micron pens. So what a micron pen is, is a pen with a very hard tip that is a particular width. You see a few, a couple of pens down, there's a rapidiograph, the white pen. So that's a technical pen and technical pens each have a different nib size that's uh, a different width. So you can either make thick lines or thin lines or, or whatever. Um, it doesn't, you can't really change the line width with pressure. Um, but it gives you, especially if you like stippling and things like that, a very solid dot. The problem with them is that they are expensive and then replacing the nibs is expensive and cleaning them is a nuisance. So when Micron came out with these archival pigment pens with uh, the tips that do basically the same thing, a lot of artists jumped on those. So those are a, a nice tool to have. There are also things like art pens, which are uh, sort of calligraphy pens or pens that are like a marker, but a brush so that you can do interesting shapes if you like a sort of a calligraphic approach. And then one thing that I use a lot, um, these pens at the bottom um, are crow quill pens is what they're referred to historically, because of course they would be like a, like the feather pen, um, but they're called dip pens. Usually when you look them up online now, you find them as dip pens and they have different types of nibs. These are not quite the same as calligraphy nibs, although these can be used for calligraphy. A lot of calligraphy nibs have an extra little kind of spoon shape at the bottom that allows you to make uh, different types of strokes for, for writing. These tend to be more of the, the scratchier tip, but they're very easy to use. And the one thing I would recommend is if you, if you like dip pens, uh, just keep them clean. You can always clean any rust off with sandpaper, um, dry them off after every use, but they're very, they're very simple to use. What I haven't shown here is one of my go-to favorites, which is just a, a black uh, ballpoint pen or a, a roller gel pen, you know, usually a fine or a medium, just because that's so easy to take with me and to draw. And I wanted to show you this item over here on the right. If any of you have ever like inherited a drafting kit or something like that, you would find one of these in there and you might've wondered what the heck it was. <laughs> so what happens 
Uh, this is a ruling pen allows you to make straight lines that are quite even. They're used a lot or they were used a lot by architects, but they're also really fun to use if you like to draw a lot of buildings. And so that's why I'm showing you this. What you do is you dip that pen end into the ink and a little bead of ink is formed in that opening. And depending on how far you have that, that screw opened up or closed in, it changes the point. And then the, as you draw, the bead of ink is pulled down and onto the paper. It's really cool. So if you ever see one of those around, um, give that a try. So when you want to create values with ink, of course, you, you don't have the option of, of smudging and blending and all of those things that we've just gone through for the last few weeks. You have to create your values um, by using things like uh, hatching and cross hatching. So this is a very orderly set of, of types of cross hatching. You know, you can make patterns any different way. And the idea in a pen and ink drawing is you want that variety. You want, you want as much variety to your textures and, and your values as you can. So you can either do very orderly and controlled type of lines like this or very free form. It kind of depends on your personality and what you're trying to do. I find that if I'm sketching somewhere or drawing, you know, uh, drawing a scene in place, uh, my lines end up looking much more like this and not so orderly. And I actually personally like a, a kind of something that's sort of in between the two. Um, I want to have enough control that everything isn't dark and everything isn't light or everything isn't mi middle value. I want to be able to, you know, change up how much white and how much dark is showing. Um, so, you know, playing around, you'll, you'll end up with your own uh, style and, and what you like to do. But I wanted to show you some artwork, uh, some of my favorite artwork through time. <laughs> and so I'm starting here with the Winnie the Pooh books and E.H. Shepard. Um, this is an extraordinarily good example of, of just beautiful, beautiful ink work. What you might not know um, from looking at books and looking at ink work and wondering how the heck they do it is that most artists and most illustrators will put some sort of pencil drawing down first and then ink over the top of that because the ink won't move the pencil. And then when it's completely dry, they will very, very carefully erase the pencil that's underneath. So if you go to an exhibit, and I've seen a lot of this um, artwork in person, you'll see either the traces of the pencil or sometimes the pencil is still left. Um, and that's how, you know, it's not as if E.H. Shepard just sat down and just boom, you know, drew this out of his head. He had done some preparatory sketches on, on tissue paper. Then he drew it, you know, reasonably carefully in pencil. But that allowed him to then use really free line work when it got to um, the point of doing this little sketch, which is just, just wonderful. And likewise, <laughs> you know, more Winnie the Pooh. But you can see in this particular case how, um, how the line work, it, it's, he's used a very thin nib for the tree and much thicker, uh, a much thicker pen nib and a more defined line for the characters. So as we go through and look, all of these, look at all of these examples of art, I've got quite a few to show you. Um, I don't want you just to go sitting back and looking at them going, oh yeah, that's nice. And I'm gonna check my email on my phone while Elizabeth's talking. What I want you to do is look at each one of these and go, you know, how, how did they do it? How, how did they make that scene work? What kind of pen nib might they have used? You know, where, where are the darks? Where are the lights? How did they, uh, what kind of pencils, uh, pen strokes were used to get certain effects? And also where are things light and where are things dark? How did they get the emphasis on the drawing? So another artist who I used to see an awful lot of uh, when I was growing up was uh, Joyce Brizzly's uh, Millie Molly Mandy books, which I just loved. And these are much more stylized, a much more stylized approach to drawing uh, using pen and ink. Once again, she would have penciled the whole thing out and then gone in and picked um, you know, what she wanted to uh, use line work on and what she didn't. If you look at this, Look at all those directional lines that tell you what's happening in the background. And also the dark and light contrast. If you squint at this and look at it, there's a really nice design to this in terms of where the lights are and where the darks are. Also notice how not everything is filled in with, with cross hatching. Some of it is and some of it isn't. And so this, this particular artist was able to do some really wonderful scenes that are just, uh, you know, just 
very true to the time, but also everything is carefully drawn. Each one of these scenes um, has a feeling of, of reality to them, even though they're obviously uh, illustrations that are, that are made up. So another artist that had a big effect on me when I was growing up was Eileen Soper, who illustrated um, a bunch of books for uh, an author named uh, Enid Blyton, who is very popular in uh, England and in Canada, actually throughout the Commonwealth. And this sort of very loose style of ink work made a big impression on me. I thought it was amazing how with just a few lines, she could get a sense of a face. You know, if you look at the girl's face on the left, the one who's by the dog. There are literally three lines or four lines making up her face. Um, just really beautifully done. Once again, there would have been some pencil sketches there first, and then she would have gone with the least amount of ink work she needed to in order to get this scene right. And I'm pointing out this business about pencil first, because when we get to doing uh, some drawing later on in this class, I want you to feel very comfortable sketching in pencil and then putting your ink over the top of it, even if you're working just with a, with a, um, a marker or with a, a ballpoint pen. So um, Eileen Soper also did other types of children's book illustrations for, for younger children. Many women at this um, particular time period, which was, you know, everything from the 20s to the 50s, really got shoveled into children's book illustration. Um, and, and that really was sort of the, the place that they could shine. Uh, whereas the fellows ended up with the art shows of their drawings and this, that, and the other. Um, there are exceptions, of course, but Eileen Soper is a good example of someone who used her talents in the children's book field. And these very delicate ways of drawing, you'll notice that all the lines aren't joined up. You know, there's a lot of sketchiness going on there. Um, but there's also a, a really good sense of design. And I included this uh, illustration of hers as well, because the sketchiness of those legs, you know, those are, she hasn't worried about drawing it from an anatomical point of view, although she obviously knows her anatomy, but the, but the sketchiness really gives that feeling of motion. Also, if you look at the, the bank here, you know, these are lines going all over the place, but there, there are values between light and dark and this, this sense of motion um, and, and action is something that's really unique to pen and ink. You can really uh, get a lot of oomph just with one color. So somebody who ha is ha kind of on the other end of, of what can be done with pen and ink is Aubrey Beardsley. And his artwork was extremely stylized, extremely planned out, beautifully, beautifully laid out. Um, and with mixes of extremely dark contrast also with, with stippling, if you, if you look at the uh, illustration on the right-hand side, in the background, there's kind of this medallion with, with birds and such. Um, really fantastic. Uh, just a good control of values all over. If you squint at the, both of these illustrations, you know, the strength of the contrast is, is really incredible. And so, and then we move on to uh, another illustrator, Howard Pyle. And these are two illustrations from his Robin Hood. Um, and once again, using all kinds of values, a lot of white. He hasn't filled in like all of the road. He hasn't filled in all of the water because he has all of this other stuff going on. But the lines and the directions of his shading help us understand that these are forms in the round. These are people. You know, so where those lines disappear around the leggings, for example, we know that the form continues on the other side beautifully drawn. He illustrated all sorts of books and, and many in, in uh, many paintings, many in color, but I particularly love his, his Robin Hood. And uh, here's another one. He did a lot of stuff with knights and, and classic sort of uh, examples. And this one relies very strongly on contrast. And as you look at these, you probably notice how they kind of harken back to woodcuts and, and uh, Durer's woodcuts and uh, all of that, all of that sort of history. Many of these artists really loved that look and reproduced the look of a woodcut using pen and ink. So moving way into the 1990s, uh, Bernie Wrightson, who's a, a contemporary artist, did an extraordinary uh, version of Frankenstein where he did everything by hand. So, so it looks like an etching, but he has done it in pen and ink. 
And if you look at the direction of these lines, uh, you know, the beam going up on the wall, the, the glass bottles, all, all of the way he made those decisions about what was going to be light and dark with all of those transparent bottles. Now, he definitely, yeah. definitely planned this all out in pencil first uh, and probably did a few rough versions to, to figure out how to, how to decide where the light was coming from and how to modulate this. So this is extremely busy and complex. The original artwork, of course, was much larger than the regular book, but uh, just extraordinary. And I've got a couple of other plates of his to show you. Um, here's, here's one of the inside of a study, um, you know, which is the relief in this is of course, that completely empty window shining in. And the, the fact that there's some light on those two faces. And this one I wanted to show you in particular because of his use of directional line. So you can see if you, if you get this feeling of the wet and dreary day by all of these lines, all of the lines on the horse, the lines on the guy's, you know, shawl, everything is just sort of, you know, you get that feeling of pouring down. So this is where pen and ink really shines because unlike pencil, where you can do lots of different things. To get this really intense contrast and this intense feeling of motion relies on, on black and white, but it also relies on a lot of planning. <laughs> so here's another way to use pen and ink. And I'm trying to show you as many examples as possible because there isn't one way to draw in pen and ink. And so uh, if, you, if anyone of, of you have ever read the, the Moomin Valley books or seen any of that, she, she, uh, Tove Jensen did her own illustrations for all of this. And they're just really incredible. She created these little characters and these little worlds that they lived in. But she was a consummate uh, illustrator. Uh, and she did actually cartooning and things like that as well. And the dark and the light contrast and how she sort of arranged the design was just really amazing. Once again, planned out in pencil first and then illustrated on top using pen and ink. So uh, to continue the illustration theme for a bit, I wanted to um, add in this by J.R.R. Tolkien. So you're probably familiar with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings books. Um, he also did quite a number of the illustrations for the early books and also just in creating this world itself. And it's a very stylized kind of take on, on what he thought the world looked like. But once again, pen and ink allows you to do that, allows you to do whatever you would like to. So you don't have to feel that everything that you do in pen and ink, um, or actually in any drawing media, has to be always realistic. Looking at realistic, uh, either the artwork or subject or, or technique or whatever is useful. It gives you a jumping off place, but it isn't where you have to stay. So to move on to the idea of place and how to draw places in pen and ink. Um, I went back to the 1500s and uh, this particular piece by Hans Lautensack, I thought was a, an interesting way to get started because he's using all kinds. I mean, he's crammed this with hatching. <laughs> There's all sorts of hatching and such going on in here. And he's got, you know, different ways of showing how those leaves look how the underside of the bridges, he's got, you know, cross hatching that goes three or four different ways. You know, he's got some light lines showing the, uh, the sky and then the water, he's following the form of the water. So we spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks talking about charcoal and how you use blending and such to show um, form. But what I, um, I really uh, didn't do with that was of course in charcoal, we didn't talk about like using line. This is more, uh, what we spoke about with pencil early on, that you can use this variety of line to create values when, when blending isn't actually an option. So the other thing I wanted to really point out in this is that he went to a much finer pen nib to do the background, the, the bit that's through the bridge on the other side. Uh, it's, it's much lighter, uh, much more pale, and it helps give you that feeling of depth because he doesn't really have any solids in here. So moving on from, from Hans, we, um, I wanted to show you a couple of um, pieces by Franklin Booth, who took the idea of sort of directional strokes to the nth degree. Now, this uh, illustration is actually much larger, and I wish I could show, you, show it to you a bit bigger, because everything in here is a, a almost nothing is a pure black. Um, everything is a very tightly controlled value 
with where he's cross-hatched with very, very close lines. Look at those clouds. I mean, talk about following the direction. Now, one thing that he did is he used diluted ink in order to do those clouds. So it's not just a matter of using a finer pen. Um, it is also possible to change your ink color, your ink consistency, to get a different look um, for more control. And sometimes uh, artists will add different ink colors together. You know, they might use a, a terracotta color and a black to get different um, effects within a, within a drawing. And here's another one um, by Franklin Booth. Now, in this particular case, he's using a super, super fine nib to do these clouds. And what I wanted to point out to you in particular is the difference between the sky and the clouds and all of that movement and how he's treated the water. In both cases, there's a, a lot of area that's left open so that you have sort of a, um, you know, a little bit of a, a change in value there. Everything isn't completely filled in. And also when he ends his line, his line stroke, see those little dots? So he took, he does a line and then he goes dot, 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 and then it goes into nothing. That allows our eye to sort of continue that movement. And using little dots like that, he did it in the water as well. You can see how when he gets to the palest part, it's just a series of little dots that go off from the end of his line. And that's something to keep in mind when you're drawing and you're trying to show that fade into, into white, into nothing. So I wanted to throw a Lloyd Rees in there as well. We had looked at his work uh, before when we were doing um, landscape stuff. And this is one of his ink drawings. And, um, you know, like Booth, he goes all out on, on the different values he's got in here. Everything from white all the way to the super densest black. So this is not a drawing that you sit at the side of a road and, and sketch, obviously. This is something you come home and, and you, you know, plan out, you figure out what's going to be the light and the dark, and you work carefully through the drawing. When you are doing something like this, a finished drawing in ink, it's very much the same as the approach in charcoal. Although you want to get those darks in there to sort of establish what the values are going to be, you don't want to go for, you don't want to get it to the darkest point right away. One thing that happens very easily in an ink drawing is everything gets too dark. Right away, you have too many darks going on. So it's better to sort of modulate that a little bit, not put in too much information. And another thing I wanted to point out is on the bricks of this house here, or both of these houses, he's done what looks like possibly a little bit of, of diluted ink uh, with a tiny brush and very, very few bricks. But you, you get the feeling that, you know, there's a stone or, or a brick front to this. And I'm pointing that out because with um, pen and ink, less is definitely more. If you're doing a drawing where you're going to fill it up with all sorts of textures and stuff, you need to have places where there are also uh, a lot less is going on. And you're letting people's imagination fill in um, some of the uh, extra spaces. The other thing I wanted to point out was that he did something a little interesting on both roofs and he left a white area, a pale area to separate the roof from the background. You don't really notice it until you really look at it. Um, but if he hadn't done that, um, it would seem like the roof just continued into the hill behind. So those are little things to keep in mind, you know, ways, ways that you have to manipulate pen and ink in order to keep your subject matter at a distance to show all of the values and to show uh, the land or whatever it is that you're drawing. So we're going to finish uh, this little segment here with a bunch of drawings by Vincent van Gogh. And not many people know how much drawing he did, but he did a ton of, of ink drawing, lots and lots of preparatory drawings for the paintings that he did. And you know, doesn't this remind you of some of that David Hockney stuff that we looked at earlier uh, in the summer? where you've got, you know, sort of blobs of flowers and leaves and, and, you know, grasses and things like that. But he really did pick almost different pencil strokes or pen strokes and different, uh, you know, uh, amounts of ink to lay down in order to, um, to really get a nice bunch of variety. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few more that continue the same theme. And you can really see he's, you know, he's mixed up using different uh, nib sizes. Um, uh, oh, somebody, somebody I think needs to mute themselves. I can, <laughs> I can hear some background noise going on there. Um, he's used, uh, you know, he's brought a little bit of brushwork in. Um, I can see the pencil, still some of the pencil traces underneath where he, he marked out kind of how he was going to go about this before he started inking. 
Um, here's another one, you know, interesting, interesting marks, uh, you know, sort of almost calligraphy marks with a thick pen down in the water at the front, and then going to uh, little tiny marks with uh, diluted ink um, in the background. So some of these you might recognize as, as paintings or part of his paintings. And I don't think many people realize how many of these drawings he did before he started the paintings. His paintings have that look as if he actually sat in the field and just did everything off the top of his head. But he often went and did quite a bit of sketching before getting to the painting part. They are, however, on extremely um, delicate paper. And they're only brought out at the Van Gogh Museum um, every few years for a very short amount of time, and only a few are shown at a time. There is a fantastic book that is very difficult to get, and I have not been able to find a, a copy at a price I can afford, <laughs> um, showing all his drawings. But, you know, once again, I'm, I want you to look at this because of the freeform nature. When we get to the part where we're going to be drawing uh, the scene for the second half of the class, if you look up uh, drawings, pen and ink drawings of this scene on Google, you'll see a lot of really stiff stuff. I mean, stuff that looks very architectural. And I want you to consider instead, um, you know, that's fine, but also consider a looser approach. Here's another uh, scene of the water, an another um, you know, landscape scene, another landscape scene. Once again, you know, very kind of, you know, David Hockney's work very much reminds me of this, uh, the, the directions and following the growth and making sure there are different strokes for different things. You know, distance, stuff up front, bushes, sky, far hills, all of it has something different going on. And so here, here we have a scene that you probably have seen as a painting. Um, it was done as actually there were many preparatory uh, um, illustrations done before he actually got to the painting part. Here's another one that you probably have seen the painting of this as well. This was really eye-opening to me when I saw these drawings because I realized, you know, the, the thought process that went in behind making those uh, painting strokes. And this was not actually done in pen and ink, but it, it resembles, it, it was done in watercolor, oil paint, uh, I'm not quite sure what else. He did. A, he, he combined a bunch of stuff on this. But you can see the pencil underneath, that he penciled the whole thing out. And that left him free to do, uh, you know, pretty open strokes uh, to finish this up. And then lastly, we have this little street scene. And I, I wanted to particularly to show you this, because this is the kind of thing that people usually end up with when they go out sketching in pen and ink. Um, you know, you can't go backwards. There's no control Z <laughs> for doing a pen and ink sketch. Um, that's why a little bit of preparation with some pencil is useful before you get started. And then you just sort of have to go for it. And, you know, stuff might not be exactly in perspective or, you know, he decided to add some people further down the street, but he'd already put the sidewalk there. So, you know, they just, they're over the lines of the sidewalk. Um, it's more important to get the scene down than it is to worry about uh, those sorts of details. So what we're going to be drawing this afternoon is, or is it this afternoon? It's still this morning, <laughs> is the Rialto Bridge in Venice. Um, what I did was I went to one of the webcam sites where you can see live the boats going back and forth. And I recorded uh, a half hour <laughs> of, of this going on. So it'll be as if we are actually in Venice uh, at the Rialto Bridge. Um, but I wanted to show you a few classic images of, of the Rialto Bridge um, that I particularly liked before we got started, because these are just different takes on exactly the same place. So um, this particular scene, obviously, it was drawn not in Venice, and there's a lot of detail to it. But it, it just has a really sort of a nice feel. In this particular case, the artist decided to concentrate on the busyness of what was going on at the docks. In this particular case, George Clausen did the kind of sketch we're going to do today. Now, this is not in ink, it's a pencil sketch, but I liked it for its immediacy. You know, he got the basics down and didn't get overly worried about doing an architectural rendition. And this is sort of the approach I would like you to take. Also, here's something else really interesting that he did. In the background on those buildings, he got those directional lines of the perspective in and then added the, you know, some loops of the 
of the windows. He didn't try to draw every single one. He just wanted to get the general feel of it. And that's something to keep in mind when you put down your preparatory lines in pencil, which I, I imagine you have a pencil around. Uh, if not, you can dive in with the pen and ink. <laughs> um, but it's something to keep in mind is getting some of those directional lines of the important parts of the bridge in place. And that leaves you a little bit of freedom to do the other bits. Now, I particularly like this uh, illustration. This is a pretty careful one, but he leaves an Albert left a lot of stuff out. <laughs> and I think that's really good. So when you look at the scene in total, There'll be boats going under the bridge. Stuff is going to be happening. You don't have to put it all in. You can just decide on one little minuscule part of the scene you see and decide to draw that. And you can let everything else fade off. In this case, you can see he actually had drawn on the lower left-hand side um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. I guess he might have been by an embankment or something like that. But he decided when he was inking it just to not bother. But he left the pencil there. It's kind of interesting. And lastly, I wanted to show you, um, so a very famous painter of, um, of Venice in general uh, was known as Canaletto. His name really was uh, Giovanni Antonio Canal. <laughs> um, but I liked this in particular because the perspective is wrong. <laughs> and I wanted to show it to you. I mean, he obviously did do this sketch while he was sitting there, but he just went for it. He didn't spend a lot of time you know, fixing things and this, that, and the other. He did a pencil sketch underneath. You can see some of the lines he did. And then he just sketched. So when you get into this and you start doing the same thing and you realize your perspective isn't quite right, the buildings don't look quite right, and all of the other things that are going to happen, you know, just remember if Canaletto can do it, you know, with funky perspective, so can you. <laughs> all right. So before we get started on that part, I do want to spend just a few minutes, if you want to get out whatever it is you're going to be drawing with, and just let's take a, a few minutes, you know, not even five minutes, just to do um, some cross hatching in your sketchbook. Uh, I just, these are some examples of different types of cross hatching. What I would like you to do is do some line work and cross hatching that's very light. Maybe the lines are far apart, or maybe you're using a thin pen, um, or maybe you're just not putting a lot of pressure down. And then do a few that are kind of in the middle, and then do a few that are, are very dark, um, just to get an idea of how, with your particular pen, you're going to make that work. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to check the chat and, uh, and see what people have been asking. Oh, the Vincent van Gogh book is available as a digital download. That is really excellent. Oh, Carl Larson, I'll have to look him up. Yes, the illustrators often did their own lettering. Um, the, uh, not all the, so when you've got to, you know, comic books and things like that, usually you've got a different letterer than the person who's actually doing the, the drawing. But often artists who are doing a book plate, for example, like those ones by Howard Pyle for Robin Hood, you know, he would have a particular layout he was after. Um, and they had great control over their pen and ink. When I first started um, in the art field, I worked for a screen printer, and we did, we drew um, the, the outline of the design, and then sort of filled it in with color. And we did our own lettering. You know, we, if it was large lettering, say we were saying surfing or something in the background, we would, we would draw it out using curves and forms and things like that. For small, smaller lettering, we just got used to hand drawing it. Um, and so, of course, those artists are going to either draw it out in pencil first or put down two or three lines so they can make sure, you know, that it's, it's uh, standard. But most of the time, they would have put their own lettering on work like that. Now, I do believe that when they, uh, you know, if an artist would get to a larger project, they might, um, that had a lot of lettering to it, they would probably uh, have somebody else working with them who, who could do that. That's a really great question, though. <laughs> Okay, just a few more minutes on hatching, and then we are going to draw the Rialto Bridge. I'm still looking for some music to play, so you're just not listening to me chatter all the time. <laughs> okay, let's wrap this up. I'm going to stop sharing for a second so I can start the other bit. Okay. All right, folks, are you ready to take a trip to Venice? Let's get this next bit going here. 
let's see. There's, there's no sound to it. So here we are. We are at the Rialto Bridge. And this particular webcam is situated in an inn um, that is, you know, right here by the bridge. And so the first thing that, you know, you might be looking at is you're looking at the building over there on the right and going, wow, there are a lot of windows there. <laughs> so I want you to forget all about those windows for the moment. And instead, just take a couple of minutes because we're going to we're going to look at this scene all the way until noon. OK, so you've got at least 20 minutes to, to look at this. Um, just sit and have a look at this and decide, you know, what, what would you like to draw and what's actually going on here? So there's a lot of boat traffic. You know, uh, visitors are, are back. Tourism is back to Venice. Unlike when we uh, looked at this scene last year for the urban sketching class, I think I had pulled this one up and there was not much going on. So the boats are a bit of a distraction when you get started. And I would strongly recommend that your first sketching that you do just in pencil, that you go ahead and ignore the boats for the moment. There'll be plenty of them going back and forth for you to choose from to add one into your drawing at a later time. So I would decide, you know, how much of the Rialto Bridge do you want to show? Um, do you want to put any of this foreground stuff in, you know, the, um, the, the lamp posts and things like that that you see on the wall? Um, do you want to, uh, put all or only a little bit of that building in that you see on the right hand side, because that really takes up quite a bit of space there. So these are just some of the initial um, initial thoughts to have. So from that, once you've decided, you know, what you want to draw, this is a good moment to do a no tan. <laughs> you knew I wasn't going to get through this whole class without mentioning, mentioning no tans again. But the, you know, even if you're just sort of holding up your your fingers and looking at this scene and going, all right, where are the lights and darks kind of interesting? You know, like if I decide not to have that building over on the right, maybe I still want to show just enough to make that shadow that's coming down onto the water make sense because that's kind of nice. Um, likewise, these, these gondolas are beautiful. They're dark, right? So there's a dark right there. If you decided you wanted to throw one of those in. So if I'm, I do a lot of maritime scenes and if I'm going to do a drawing um, or a painting and I'm looking at real life like this, trying to figure out what's going on, I will often do some sketches of the boats to the side, like not try to put them actually in my scene to start off with because, you know, that boat's going by, right? And then the next boat comes through at a different angle. It can be difficult to figure out how you're going to make that work. So as you lay out your, your scene in pencil, and then you decide you'd like to, you know, get started on the ink work, but you would like to have a gondola in there, you might just want to, you know, in pencil or in pen, sketch a couple of gondolas out to the side, you know, see what sort of angle you like. Now, this part, this is all going to be part of the video that I post up on YouTube. And you can go to skylinewebcams.com uh, and you can, uh, you know, go to these sites anytime you can um, take screen captures or you can take pictures right there um, on the site and other people have got stills as well. So there are lots of opportunities to, to freeze frame <laughs> and, and to draw that gondola properly. But let's just pretend we're just hanging out of the window right now. We're near St. Mark's Basin. You know, we're, we're in uh, Venice for 20 minutes <laughs> and we need to sketch something. So. You know, how much can you get done during that particular time period? Obviously, you're not going to do one of those, um, you know, super incredible booth illustrations during that time period. But you can at least get a sense of the bridge. And if you think back to that, uh, that little pencil sketch I showed you just before we started all of this, where the fellow had not even darkened in all of those arches that you see going across the bridge, you could just... Uh, darken in one of them and that gives you enough information to know what's going on with the rest of the scene or you could just darken in the top part where it arches over and likewise that would tell you information about what's going on so if i'm looking at this scene and if i were making the decision about what to draw i think the things i would think were um, the most important is to try to get that angle of the rialto bridge about right because that's pretty pretty unique i would count the little doohickeys, a little, you know, semicircle dark areas and, and pencil in where those are, are going to go. And then when they, I do the ink, I'd probably do those pretty dark. 
And I also would be concentrating on the particular arc and shadow underneath the bridge, because that to me really kind of makes it. That's why artists like to draw bridges is the shadows that they cast as much as the shape of the bridge themselves itself. And I do like that shadow over um, being cast by the building down on the water. And I'd, I probably would end up putting a, um, a gondola or two in there somewhere, but maybe in silhouette. So as you're watching the scene and you're seeing these boats go underneath the bridge, you'll notice how there's a lot of information in them when they're close to us. You know, now you're starting to think about how do I do those highlights and what's that cabin like and there are people and blah, 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 blah. Once they go under that bridge, you can't see all of that information. They just turn into a silhouette. So that's a really convenient you know, place to put your gondola <laughs> because then you're just doing a little silhouette and you're not worrying about too much else. Okay, everyone, while you are uh, drawing away, I'm going to read you a little bit from Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting by John F. Carlson, and this was written in 1958. And although this uh, book is obviously about painting, there's quite a bit in here that applies to drawing and to composition and that sort of thing. So I thought I'd read to you while you're sketching away. So this is on the use of a finder, and by that he means a viewfinder. I have found that beginners in landscape painting have a difficult time during the first few weeks out of doors in selecting and arranging their subject or motif. It is difficult to see what has and what has not pictorial properties. Beginners are bewildered by the wealth of inspirational material that surrounds them, stretching away in all directions to infinite distances. They are in much the same fix as when one is trying to select a new garment, and the salesman brings forth too abundant an array of samples thereby blunting the purchaser's faculty of choice. It is for this reason that beginners generally begin by trying to paint all of outdoors on one canvas. Few studies are produced that stop at the few elements well conceived that a canvas needs. We have to learn to see. To help a beginner learn to select, I re recommend the use of a finder as a mechanical aid. A finder is merely a piece of cardboard, approximately eight by 10 inches, in the center of which an oblong opening has been cut, approximately four by five and a half inches. By holding this matter frame before you, a foot or more away from your eyes and closing one eye, your motif is shut off or segregated from the surrounding landscape. The view in the finder will assume a picture-like aspect. If you carefully study your masses, raising or lowering the finder until an arrangement is arrived at, much fun and some help will result. After you have acquired the habit of selection, you can lay the finder aside. Selection. I have often told my students that if they would only spend as much time arranging their motif, eliminating, sacrificing, moving, as they do upon just painting of the thing, the road to mastery would be much shortened. Most of the time I find students have planted themselves in some place that was comfortable or near some friendly fellow student rather than at some place from which their selection or motif was at its best. After a time, the student can, of course, paint any old thing from any old place, even indoors. But the beginnings have to be beginnings, and the student cannot start where the master leaves off. Okay, now he has some things to say about composition, the expressive properties of line and mass. It is certain that all lines related to rectangular or simple geometric shapes produce within us an entirely different set of emotions than do lines possessing a playfully meandering quality. Between those two extremes, there exist other lines, numerous combinations and half steps of line that in their measure and quality react upon our feelings. Even the slight knowledge of this semi-scientific truth will start us thinking. Art is art only when it is confined within a self-imposed form. A sonata in music, an ode in poetry, a building in architecture, these becomes work, become works of art through confirmation to a, to a form. All else is just noise or babble or piles of stone, ends that anybody could achieve. Any artistic expression, a sonata for instance, is most beautiful when it does not obviously follow fixed form. Thousands of sonatas have been written and thousands more will be written, all entirely different in expression and still sonatas. 
There are limitations to the form, its special rhythm or meter or style or color. A thing becomes a design only when invisible limitations are strictly held. Form or limitation does not make a work of art, but all works of art partake of a form. It requires art to speak within a given form, even if such speaking is not always art. It is taken for granted here, of course, that the men who are going to speak within a given form are inspired men, that they have something to say with their form and are not merely professors or for, of form for its own sake. <laughs> However, there's a limit even to this way of reasoning. The form, I mean, has not a utilitarian end, but an aesthetic beginning. The form, I mean, is one that should guide us in avoiding artistic pitfalls. While saying go to the limit, it also hints where that limit is in order to save us from ranting. <laughs> If we go past the limit of one aesthetic form, splashing over the edges of the comic into the tragic, for instance, we arrive at the absurd before we are aware of it. A work of art possesses a calm dignity that waits quietly to enthrall the eye and soul. It does not scream out, nor yet hide behind cryptic or esoteric symbols. Its beauty appeals to all men. The difference is in degree. Its strength lies in the felt foundation of reserved strength, and not in breathless exhaustion. The most expressive form or key or line scheme or color gamut is legitimate limitation of each attempt. Each, every result should be different from the last on account of the differing limitations of the form chosen for its vehicle. The choosing of expressive limitation is not child's play. It is mature choice. The painter's vehicle is his color, his line and mass, his form, and the pigments and materials with which he works. Having so small, and in other ways so great, a gamut from which to choose or organize his picture, intelligent selection is necessary. By all means, you must choose. A painter, like all other creators, must see through his motif into its significance, and then choose his means accordingly. It is my hope that this work will inspire in the student a habit of analysis and consideration of his artistic means, so that when he has learned to paint, he will use the acquired craft for artistic ends. I believe that in many schools, not enough emphasis is laid upon this all-important phase of art education. I have found many students who, in looking for something to paint, would search out the most comfortable or shadiest spot, and there set up their easel. They would, after an hour's work, be hopelessly fuddled as to why they even began their sketch at all. The everyday elements in an out-of-door motif which ar arrest the cursory glance do so by containing something that interests us. We ought to analyze those interests and hold to them firmly. Nature, by virtue of possessing light, space, sound, and movement, presents to us out of this huge storehouse an abundance of interesting and compelling images. Were we to attempt to translate more than an aesthetic impression of these wonders with our limited means, our paint and canvas, we would be lost indeed. Furthermore, should we succeed, we would but reproduce a kind of secondary or imitative nature and not art, and the imitation would always suffer by contrast with the original. Art is the transmittable personal impression of one quality in the quantity before us. The other qualities possessed by the same motif we must merely use as foils for the main message if we use them at all. Best of all, we can save those other qualities for some other canvas. It is the ability to determine consciously what it is that interests us and why that differentiates the artist from the art student. Empirical knowledge comes to be a great factor in artistic creation. This is really an accumulation of experiences and consequently accumulated emotions transmuted in time into a general or universal emotion from which all specific emotions draw their lifeblood. As an illustration, let us consider one of our inexperienced art student graduates entering the woods to sketch. A very torrent of emotion may transfix him. He stands almost aghast at the beauty of this dim-lighted dim -lighted green sanctuary. Feverishly, he begins to paint, but soon he sadly realizes that he is unable to grasp the thing before him. He resorts to technical ruses and subterfuges. He uses every recipe or symbol he has learned. He tries to recall all the eulogies of art he has ever read. Nothing helps. His difficulty is that he has not visited the woods often enough to, inquire, to have acquired empirical knowledge or experience and the consequent, consequent accumulation of emotions. 
The very qualities that thrilled him upon his entrance have been dimmed in his mind by a thousand obstacles. He feels his unfitness. He goes home a sadder and wiser man. If he is truly wise, he will return the next day and a hundred other days. Gradually, the secret of the woods will reveal itself to him. The tempered light and the repressed color gamut, the preponderance of upright lines, the flickering sun patches upon the flowery earth, the interesting doings of the trees, the gold-green tonality of the whole, all of these things that thrilled him he will gradually recognize. He will feel and see his woods by and by. Okay, here's one last little bit from the same chapter. Let us now return to the proposition before us, the abstract expressive differences to be found in one kind of line and mass as against another. Just as with abstract expression or feeling, there is a tremendous difference in a line of rolling character compared with a geometric angular or straight line. The first is quick moving, lively, the other inexorable, cold and profound. All lines are possible between these two extremes. The rolling line becomes the circle, the ellipse, and the spiral. The increasing motion of a line leaves the rectilinear, leaving the rectilinear is caused by its degree of departure. It can be sudden, it can be gradual. There are playful lines, ridiculous lines, grotesque lines, dramatic lines, sublime lines, tragic lines, hanging lines, aggressive lines, lethargic lines, static lines. All have their intrinsic significance. Okay, back to the work at hand. So if any of you are adding boats into your scene um, and have sketched some on the side, this is a, a good time right now to sort of figure out where that boat's going to be within the scene. And once again, I would highly suggest, um, you know, sketching it in there first, because once you start adding a boat in, now you're adding a new object that has to be in perspective. So when we were talking about perspective lines early on, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, where is our eye level um, and that the lines above our eye level will slope down towards the horizon and the lines below our eye level will slope up towards the horizon. You can see this really clearly here. Um, you know, our eye level is, uh, you know, about that first um, horizontal demarcation on the building across the way. And if we look, you know, underneath the bridge, obviously, uh, you know, the, the reddish building there is somewhere around our eye level. So that means that the edges of the bridge that we can't see, because it's all sort of, you know, we've got a lost edge underneath the bridge there where it's fading into its own shadow. It does mean that if we were to see that line, if we could see it clearly, that line would correspondingly be going from the lower aspect at the left, slightly raised up towards the right and heading towards the horizon. And that means, means that the boats that are also in that vicinity underneath the bridge also have to operate in that same perspective. Because if you think of where the water cuts off the boat, um, it doesn't really matter what's going on underneath the water. What does matter is that line that's made, that water line, has to be at the same type of parallel as the surrounding architecture for, in order for it to read right. So something that happens um, frequently in marine art, which is how people refer to, you know, artwork of boats and that sort of thing, or artwork that has boats in it, is that that, that observation of where the uh, perspective is, is really not noticed. And, and the boat will look like it's tipping up too far, you know, the bow is too um, far up or too far down. It won't look like all of the boats in the scene um, are on the same plane of water as each other. And so if you find that your boat is doing that, if it looks like it's just about to take off uh, up into space, or if it, it just doesn't look like it's part of the scene, double check your water line to the surrounding architecture and make sure that, that in that, in, at that distance from us or uh, at that you know, elevation heading towards the horizon, that you've got um, those lines indicated just as if they were little buildings, as if, there were, as if that was a little building out in the middle of the water and you needed to check all of those lines. Boats are tricky for that because of course they have their own swooping lines. 
um, you know, to the actual construction of the boat itself. But the water line is going to be the water line. That is not going to change. Uh, even, even if you've got a little bit of surf and, or, or a little wake going like this one, you still have that water line, which has its own very specific perspective um, as it moves um, towards you or further away from you. So that's just something if you are, uh, you know, doing any boating or near any water this summer, just something to keep an eye on. Okay, about two more minutes and we'll, we'll wrap this up. I realized I didn't show you that still life drawing. I'm not quite sure what I did with it. So I'm going to go grab the real thing so I can just show it to you in the camera in just a second. Doesn't it look like fun to be in Venice right now? <laughs> that could be us. You could, you could be there being gondolaed around. All right, folks, time to bring it to a close. I'm going to go ahead and close this down for the moment. All right, everybody. So we took a trip to Italy. Who knew we were going to do that today? <laughs> so just to wrap things up, I hope I show, I'm going to send around the PDF like I always do, but I hoped that what I showed you is that there are so many ways to do pen and ink, so many ways. And if you like a particular artist's uh, approach and, and you want to try more of that, you know, either look them up online or look at the examples I've sent and try copying them. Because this is that business about learning from the masters. By copying what they did, you'll get a sense of how they... Um, how they use their stroke, how they drew. And what, is, what you'll notice also is a lot of these artists, the work is from the early part of the 1900s. And that is because not only was advertising and such use and, and book illustration using a lot of black and white, but also there was a much greater cultural interest in drawing. And then somewhere around the 40s and 50s, you know, abstract expressionism came along and we lost all of that. We lost all of that history of drawing. And people who are, who are drawing now, we're having to leapfrog back in time over, the, over all of that abstract stuff, which I like very much, but it's really too bad that that entire um, trajectory of drawing didn't continue and that we didn't all learn that. So, you know, take the time to learn from those masters, whether it's copying, you know, the Winnie the Pooh illustrations or whatever it happens to be. There's a lot to be learned there. There's a lot of their schooling that we learn by copying their work. So there we go, pen and ink. Next week, we're going to be doing people. I divided it into places and people. So next week, we'll be doing pen and ink people. And I wanted to show you just before we left how my, how my drawing turned out from the charcoal drawing last week. So I spent a couple more hours on this oh and you can, see, you, can, you can see pretty well how I got an awful lot more depth. I'm, when I went from, and I'll include the, the image, I did take a proper photo of this. I'll put it in the PDF. So, you know, I spent a lot more time sorting out the picture, sorting out the reflections, what was dark, what was light, how that was going to work. And, you know, I wanted you to see this because we do, a, we do a ton of sketching in this class, but you can, if you sit there and just spend it, you know, I spent maybe a couple more hours on this. You can, you can definitely get more out of your materials. So this is, you know, this is charcoal taken to, you know, it's pretty much its conclusion. I've got every value in there from light to dark. And one thing I'd like to point out um, is, you know, you've got lost edges here. You've also got lost edges where, um, where the white rim just sort of disappears into the background. And those are the sorts of things that you look for in order to be able to get that sense of realism. And finally, the no tan. <laughs> I'm back to the no tan again. But my no tan, I had made sure I had, you know, I had this like little line here of the fold. And I was going to leave it out. You know, I got to the end and I had forgotten all about that. And I looked at my no tan and I said, hey, you know, I've got, I really probably should put that in. That I liked that, that angular line for a reason. And I'm glad I did because it really, it, if, if I take it out, you've got a scene, right? But it just doesn't have quite that same feeling. So this is why 
this is why I'm harping on you about no tans all the time. Um, that initial impression you have of what you like about the scene by doing that little sketch keeps it in your head and you can refer back to it at the end. And that way your art really sort of comes together. Otherwise you just sort of wander off, you know, you wander off in some direction never to return. So this sort of brings it back to completion. 